Today, a million wildlife species are facing the threat of extinction. What's frightening? They're dying off faster than ever before. It's just a really unnerving feeling knowing that somewhere down the road, the animals that we have today may only exist behind glass like what we're seeing here. But we live in a tiny city-state. I wonder, how can we possibly make biodiversity an issue that matters to more people in Singapore? I'm Shushan, born and bred in Singapore. And in my time as a journalist, my favourite stories to cover were always the ones about nature. I discovered a secret sanctuary for gibbons rescued from poachers in Malaysia. Yes, I have a gibbon for it. Explored the mountains of Borneo. We reached 10% of our journey. <laughs> 10%. And spent my holidays in other natural wonders abroad. Right COVID-19 put an end to my trips abroad. But being stuck in Singapore has turned out to be an eye-opening experience. He's just looking at us with his eyes wide open. Oh, it's so cute. In this two-part documentary, I come face to face with some of the rarest species in the world right here in Singapore. To think that they exist amongst us in our forests blows my mind, really. And meet the tenacious men and women in the uphill battle to save these creatures from extinction. These crabs are only found in Singapore. In the last 200 years, we have lost nearly a third of our native wildlife. Can we make it in time to stop the remaining species from disappearing forever? It was thought to be the last one of its tribe. In the history of humanity, we've been exploiting the bounties of nature for our needs. You could almost say it's in our nature. But have we come to a point where we've gone too far? What do we stand to lose when our own flora and fauna go extinct? And what role can our tiny city-state possibly play in preserving our planet's biodiversity? That's what I'll try to find out in It's In Our Nature. Oh. I love spending my mornings here. But today, I'm not here for a casual hike. I'm taking part in a competition, a five-hour bird race. Hi. Hi. Okay, so has the race started? Yeah, we are ready to run. Ooh, this is getting exciting. Okay, so where are we going today? I think uh, we just hang around here and look at the tree and see what kinds of birds find this tree. It's not exactly the kind of race I was expecting. Most bird watching is done being still at a one stationary location. Yeah. yeah. We just stare at the tree. That's really the most exciting thing people do. I'll just look at what you're doing and copy you. The Bird Race is an annual competition organised by Nature Society Singapore. And participants race to, well, spot the birds. Each species is assigned a point between one and five, depending on how common or rare they are. And the team with the most points wins. They started bird watching at noon yesterday. Wow. Yeah, and you see their seriousness. Yeah, they're not they're yeah. not even talking, you know, they are like very focused, you know, they are like all out to get like a hundred kinds of birds, yeah. Well, the game is on. I've got my gear ready and I can't wait to get started. Tell me what I should be looking out for. Oh, there you see yeah, that. Oh yeah. Yeah, you see that? Yeah. Oh, it's on the branch. Oh, you I see, see it, that? I see it, yeah. It's a what is it? It's a blue filtered bee eater. Wow. Dingley has been bird watching for more than two decades, but what started as a hobby eventually became his day job. Today, he works with BirdLife International, a bird conservation NGO. So I really can't get a better guide for my virgin bird race. Oh, oh you see there's four birds in the sky? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Five point, five point. All right. Those are blue rum parrots. Wow, we've got this five point birds, man. This is what it looks like. Oh, nice. Oh, you heard that high pitch call? Yeah. Oh, I see, see it, I see it, yeah. It's been an hour of straining our necks, but it's paid off. We've spotted 20 species of forest birds. And you could say by this time, Dingley could add one more bird watching convert to its list. Oh, 
A great regret now. A great regret flying across. Wow, it's so graceful. Okay. I get it goes bomb. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been so excited about our feathered creatures. I've been told in the last decade, more than 400 species of birds have been recorded on our island. We spotted another 15 more species before heading to Sungai Bulo, a hot spot for migratory birds. Dingley tells me more than a hundred different species stop over here on our island on their way to other parts of the region. You see all the brown birds on the mud? Yeah, so they're very small. Near to the water's edge, yeah. there's uh, like 60, 70 brown birds there. So these are windbrows, and windbrows are shore birds that live in the high tundra of, of Siberia. Wow. So literally right at the top of the continent. And to come here, they will have to fly more than six, 7,000 kilometers one way. Previously, Singapore was thought to be a stopover only on the East Asian Australasian flyway. But a new study just published found that some birds which spend their winters in Singapore actually made their way from the Himalayas, making us part of the Central Asian flyway as well. All in all, Thousands of migratory birds stop over on our island between August and March every year. I guess you could say we are an air hub in more ways than we realised. Why does our island matter to these migratory birds? So Singapore, by virtue of our position, makes us uh, really an important hop-off point for birds on their migrations. You see, we are right at the tip of the Malay Peninsula. So a lot of these birds that are moving down the peninsula, they would, you know, fly through Singapore, and this is the last chance for them to refuel before they go to Indonesia. They have to fly across the sea, and flying across the sea is not easy for migratory birds. Are all pit stops equally important? For the case of birds of prey, for example, we are beginning to find that Singapore is a very important uh, pit stop for eagles and hawks going on to Indonesia. Mm. On certain days, we count up to a thousand eagles passing through Singapore on their way to Indonesia. Wow. So we're going here? Yep. Okay, so we're just in the last few minutes of the race and we've just chosen this spot to kind of try and spot a few more birds in the last six minutes. Hey, all see ya, see, see, see in the sky. That's the lesser adjutant. Ray Robert, you got to put that in. Uh. Lesser adjutant. What, what about this one here? Oh, little heron, oh, little heron. Little yeah, heron, little okay, heron. we've seen that. Oh, common, common sandpiper. Common sandpiper. Yeah, yeah, another one. Yeah, you see? They know the bird race is ending. They're all just showing up finally, like, okay, last check. Robert, you want to submit the result now? Huh? You finalise the list, then I go and check it. All right, there we go. I've submitted the final list for today's race. So, uh, we've got about 40 birds all together, which is not a, not a bad count. Well done, guys. Well done. I think we all deserve a drink. So. You know, before this, I may have thought, so what, a bird is a bird. But what I've discovered today is that there are so many different types of species of birds. And within the species itself, there are multiple subspecies. It's opened my eyes to how little I know about our native wildlife. I want to find out more. And I'm choosing to start at the Museum of the Living Dead. It says here that we may have over 40,000 species of plants and animals. I didn't know that. This museum showcases a collection of wildlife specimens from across Southeast Asia, including flora and fauna native to Singapore. And I've asked to meet Professor Liu Tan, a man some might call the godfather of local biodiversity. He's among the first few Singaporeans to fight to save our wildlife. So the exhibition says we may have over 40,000 plant and animal species in Singapore. We have more trees in Singapore species than the whole of North America in one square kilometre. Because we are in the tropics, we have a greater biodiversity. We have such a rich diversity of corals, almost 250 species, which form almost a third of the total corals in the world. We probably have a third of the species of crab in Southeast Asia. Not all of them edible. Why do we have such rich biodiversity in spite of being a city-state? We were once part of the natural 
rainforest, tropical rainforest. Malaysia and Singapore were joined at one point in time in our geological history. Not only, all the way to Australia. Dinosaurs once walked through Singapore. We call the abundance of wildlife biodiversity. And over the last 200 years, Singapore has lost almost a third of native wildlife. Now, the only chance we might get to see them is through the eyes of Kate Pocklington. She's handled at least 50,000 species of wildlife, all of them dead, and many locally extinct. Kate is an animal artisan. She restores animal carcasses and then works to portray them in their natural state. Today, she's preparing some specimens for an upcoming exhibition. OK, so we've got um, the Malayan tiger, cream-coloured squirrel, and these two are both extinct in Singapore. 1909? Yeah, wow. pretty old. Yep. This is an ancient specimen. <laughs> My goodness. Specimen one, one of the largest squirrels in the world. First discovered by Sir Stamford Raffles in 1821, it was said to be abundantly present in the woods. So the first thing we're going to do is like basic, just give it a clean. So just... Yeah, just go with the uh, direction of the fur. I feel like I'm grooming my cat. In fact, they were so common that up until the late 60s, they were sold as food or pets. But the species hasn't been spotted on our island since 1995. Specimen 2, a Malayan tiger. They're only found in the Malay Peninsula. The first recorded sighting, 1831, after it mauled someone to death. And as development encroached on their habitats, these attacks became increasingly common. A bounty was even given for every tiger killed. The last one on our island was shot in 1930. My job today, to make this sculpted tooth as realistic as possible. That one over there is missing a tooth. When it's on display, it really wants to look kind of scientifically accurate. Mm -hmm. So I got this one out to show you how the teeth should look. Wow. So. Shall I? Um... Oh, sorry, am I taking no, too long? No, you're not taking too long, no, not at all. <gasps> I'll just do a few lines on it, is that OK? Sure. And then we can try it. So cool. He's really bringing it to life right now. Look at that. It's amazing, Kate. Why do you think it's important that other people get to see these specimens? If they're already extinct, then this is the only chance that we've got to see them, right? Mm. So it's kind of important that I do whatever I can to keep them this way so that people in the future will understand what we had. Mm. Yeah, it's very different from looking at a photo, you know? Yeah. When it's just in little bits and pieces, it's kind of hard to tell what you're looking at, but now that we've really put it together, it's really starting to take the shape of a tiger. I, I might not have been much help, but I'm feeling proud that I've had a hand in preserving our natural heritage especially since more than 1,600 native species are on the edge of extinction, according to the Singapore Red Data book, last published in 2008. One of them is this Raffles Bandit Langer. Only 67 are left in the wild. So this one at the back died in 1987. And it's actually one of the old curators of the museum saw it. Um, it was thought to be the last one of its tribe. So Kate, why do you think we've lost so many species of animals in Singapore? Habitat loss for different animals and urbanisation happened quite fast. You know, land use changes, um, deforestation. So with habitat loss makes it more difficult for animals to find, you know, food, not as much space to live. Our island was once covered in forests 
But after the British arrived, most of it was razed to the ground, replaced by profitable plantations. By 1900, 90% of our original forest cover was gone. Rapid urbanization in the 1960s destroyed even more forests and coastal habitats. And as we continue to encroach on their habitats, more animals are being spotted in ours, in distress. Oh, there it is. Yeah. I see it. Oh, no. It looks dead. It looks dead? I don't know whether it's alive or not. Earlier, I discovered that we could have more than 40,000 species of plants and animals in Singapore. That's the good news. The bad news, more than a thousand of our native wildlife are on the brink of disappearing forever. Urbanization happens, you know, land use changes, deforestation. Which is why today, the folks at Acres are busier than ever. Acres runs the only wildlife rescue hotline in Singapore. A small bat, you found it on the floor. Why don't you send a picture of the bat to us, WhatsApp on this number. And since they started in 2009, they've dealt with all sorts of cases. Injured birds, distressed mammals, or reptiles that simply crawled their way into people's homes. Another call. Hello, Acres Hotline. It really seems like the calls are coming in non-stop. Yep. Why do you think that's the case? Uh, I think one thing is definitely more people know about us. Uh, so they, they, they call us. The other thing can be like, we're getting more urbanised, more land is being cleared. So um, more animals are being seen in public places. Not all bad. I mean, I guess it goes to show that people do care, right? Yeah, people do care and that's great. Uh, and, and, but that's one of the reasons why our call volume has increased also. Uh, so, I mean, we are trying our best to help us reach out to as many as possible. Our first rescue of the day, a python that has slithered its way into a backyard. And we're off to catch it and release it back into the wild. So they've given me a pair of gloves. I'm going to assist in some way, uh, if it's not too dangerous, of course. Yeah, this is exciting. So the key is to just be calm? Just to be calm, yeah. Because he doesn't see me as a threat, so he's pretty chill. Uh. In you go. All right, rescue one, done. Next stop, a student care centre. A baby common palm civet was found ambling around. And it sounds like it's in distress. Yeah, give me the towel. Here, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, okay. I'm just going to give him a bit of electrolyte, see whether he takes it. Oh, there you go. Civets are nocturnal, so they aren't a common sight in the day. But even if you've never seen them, you might have tasted their poop. These mammals can excrete one of the most expensive coffee beans in the world, Kopi Luak. How's it he looking? seems a bit wet, so that was a bit of concern now whether he, whether it was blood or anything like that. But no, see no issue. So he looks alert. Civets typically live in forests, but the adaptable creature is also comfortable among trees in urban areas. For this baby civet, Kalai thinks his mother could be nearby. So they've just identified this area as a possible place to release the civet. I mean, it's really ideal because it's a huge tree where it can kind of climb up and make itself comfortable. Okay. 
Só rir? Oh, there you go, there, 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 there. Oh. But my euphoria didn't last long. Hello, Anchor's Hotline. Hello. Hi, this is Anchor's Hotline. Hello. It's a rescue that needs our immediate attention. She sounded quite panicky. If you wait too long, uh, the animal can die from dehydration, bleeding, that can be fatal. None of my previous rescues have prepared me for what I'm about to see next. Uh, oh, there it is. Yeah. I see it. Oh, no. It looks dead. It looks dead? I don't know whether it's alive. It's a Sunda Kalugo that's on the brink of death. Still alive. They're saying that it's still alive, but it's not moving as much as it was. I need to rush this because it's barely alive. This is one of only two species of Kalugos found in the world. And these tree dwellers can travel up to 136 metres in a single glide. That's longer than the length of a football field. Kalai thinks this baby might have flown straight into this barbed wire. A 2007 study estimated that just 1,000 of them are left here. And that's why every single one matters. Yeah, it seems like one of it, one of its body parts is stuck in the wire. Oh, it's bad. Oh, it is? It's very bad. So it's twisted. I mean, I can't even imagine how terrifying this must be for the creature. Yeah, there you go. After 15 minutes, the Kalugo is finally released. It's okay. There you go. It's all right. It's going to be okay. Oh. So we need to go back and check exactly which part of the the wing, the petagium, the injuries are. La. Yeah, it, it looked quite bad. Any delay in treatment could reduce its chance of survival. So you've just snipped off the entire... This is the off. part that was torn and probably um, hooked onto the wire. So it's all dead membrane. So we just removed it. it. There's no bleeding. So what's your assessment of the situation so far? Mm, it's actually pretty good. He can be reunited with his mommy. Great. And after eight hours, three successful rescues, I've come to see how crucial a role the team here plays in preserving our wildlife. But just when I thought my day was over... Well, I just got a call from Acres that they just rescued one of the most elusive creatures in the world. And it's now at the zoo, so I'm rushing there now. I'm about to come face to face with a species that's not just critically endangered here, but also all around the world. Oh, look at it. This is the Sunda pangolin. It's one of the three critically endangered species of pangolins in the world. It's very typical of pangolins to come out of their natural habitat to just explore. We're going to give him a sedative. Pangolins are sent to the zoo whenever they're rescued. This one was found curled up and stranded on a road divider and sent here to be examined. Pangolins are the only mammals in the world with these protective scales. And this feature has made them the most trafficked mammal in the world. More than a million of them have been poached and killed for their scales in the last decade. People actually believe that those scales give people strength. They're actually just made out of keratin, which is the same thing that you have with your fingernails. So people might as well just eat their fingernails. Now that it's fully sedated, the team needs to work fast. Two hours and longer, yeah. then you'll start seeing blood pressure is dropping. Mm -hmm. And within seconds, Dr. Abraham spots the first sign of trouble, a laceration on its tail. 
Most probably the animal got himself caught in some netting somewhere. The team needs to run more tests to determine the full extent of its injury. So they've just taken it into a separate room and they've laid it on the table. I think they're going to do some scans on it now. That wound on the tail, that bone is slightly affected. Yeah. And to also make sure that uh, the internal structures are OK. The mood in here is quite serious. I guess there's a lot at stake when you're dealing with an animal that is really endangered. So we're just going to clean that wound. Besides these wounds, he's actually in very good condition. So you're generally quite happy with what you're oh. seeing now. I guess everyone in here is quite relieved that it's healthy enough to be rehabilitated into the wild. The final procedure, a microchip implant with a unique identification code. It's part of regional efforts to collect data on this elusive creature. C583. C583. It's nice to see these pangolins in Singapore. Actually, most of them are in really good condition when they come into us, as opposed to the regional countries where they see animals that come in, in under large confiscations and the animals are half dead. Because they're endangered, every single individual plays a role. If we don't intervene, if we don't try to help it, these things don't actually have a chance. Habitat loss, however, isn't the only threat to our most endangered native species. Meet the invader. And you might well have played a role in this invasion. I've come face to face with rare creatures. This is the penguin. Yes. And rescued wildlife in distress. Oh, there you go. There, 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 there. You're getting more urbanized, so more animals are being seen in public places. But habitat loss isn't the only threat. There's also alien species that threaten to evict them from their homes. Darren is studying one particular intruder. Hey, Darren. So loud. I'm looking at the experiment in progress now. So the two of them are going to start fighting each other. The Defender, the lowland freshwater crab that's native to our island. The Challenger, the red claw crayfish, a species that doesn't belong here. The crayfish, if it decides to start uh, looking for a shelter, it will try to evict the crab. These red claw crayfish were first brought in through the aquarium trade and released into our reservoirs by irresponsible pet owners. Oh, oh, he's going straight for it. Oh, oh, he's actually going in. Oh my goodness. And it doesn't take long to see why these guys are a threat. Well, it looks like the crab is trying to defend its home. Uh, the crab just doesn't want to go out, right? When you lose your shelter, that makes you more prone to predation. It's pushing the crayfish is pushing the crab out. And look at that show of aggression right there. If this were the wild, this crab would be toast. Should we be concerned? Well, invasive species are among the top threats to biodiversity. They are breeding in the wild, and their numbers are significant enough that they are um, spreading from the reservoirs, where many of them were initially introduced. Um, to other water bodies, including sometimes to some of the forest streams where our native uh, freshwater crabs uh, are living. Ultimately, this becomes a concern because some of our species are found in Singapore and nowhere else in the world. This could even potentially lead to extinction. It's complete extinction. These crayfish have already been found close to the habitats of some of our three native crabs that exist only in Singapore. And one of these species ranks among the world's 100 most endangered. The Singapore freshwater crab. It was originally known to be found in just three streams on our island. These crabs are particularly fussy about where they live. They're sensitive to changes in the environment. And climate change is shrinking their options. 
Daniel is trying to introduce them into more streams across the island. It must be the tiniest crab I've ever seen in my life. It's like not even the size of my eye. He's among the first to successfully breed them in captivity. These five to eight month old hatchlings are his 17th and 18th batch. And today, we're going to be releasing them into the wild. Daniel, you're so fast. I can't even keep up. Oh my God, treacherous. The survival of these tiny invertebrates hinges on a magnitude of factors. They need fast-flowing hill streams with the right pH level and a high amount of oxygen. Changes in weather patterns could affect their survival. Okay, so we have reached the place that we are releasing the crabs. That's a lot of demands for something so tiny. What's at stake if this species vanishes from our hill streams? It plays a number of uh, roles in the ecosystem. It will feed on leaf litter, as well as also dead animals that's present in the stream. It is also an opportunistic predator who will predate on uh, small animals inside the stream. So all these species are part of the ecosystem, all interdependent on each other. With the removal of one species, such as the Singapore freshwater crab, it may have an adverse impact on the stream ecosystem and potentially affect the entire stream ecosystem as well as its other inhabitants. So then, with the loss of one species, could the ecosystem collapse? It's possible. There's still so much that scientists don't know. But if one tiny critter can potentially have a huge impact on our ecosystem, what about the most prolific group in the animal kingdom? The insects. I want to find out more. So I'm meeting someone who cares for more than 21,000 insects, including some native species. What is that? Oh, that's the red wing giant green stick insect. Oh my goodness. They're actually local to Singapore. Also under her care are some endangered species. Delvin wastes no time in putting me to work. I will need you to help me sweep up all the fresh that's accumulated on the newspaper over here. You've got to be careful not to kill any of them. You're killing an endangered species. Can I move the bottles a bit? Yeah. Oh. There you go. Is that clean enough? Then Does that make it look? happy? Uh, yes. Most people would think of insects as pests. Why do you care so much about insects? Invertebrates are very unique. They play a part in almost every ecological process out there. We need them more than they need us. Insects are responsible for approximately 80% of the pollination out there. Pollination is needed for our crops and that gives us food security. Pollinators are responsible for fertilising 35% of the food crops we consume. Without them, most plants can't disperse their pollen. And butterflies are among some of the most important pollinators. We are going to collect some butterflies. I'm going to show you how it's done. So we gently grab them and hold them by the wings and then we drop them into the basket over here. OK. Oh, this thing just sprayed something on me. Yeah. Is that a defence mechanism? It excretes some liquid and all. <laughs> What was that liquid? Uh, don't worry, it's, it's nothing. It's just a, a normal excretion that is quite common after they have... Must be emerged. something gross, right? That's why you're not telling me. <laughs> We're going to be releasing them into the aviary. Wow! Most of the time, we tend to undermine the roles of insects in our ecosystem, but we have discovered approximately a million species. At the same time, scientists also predict there's so many more out there that we still have yet to discover. Having not discovered them, we don't exactly understand the total impact. How much are we benefiting from them? OK, so we're going to release the butterflies now. Yay! And you can do the honours. Really? Yes. Oh, wow. 
scientists believe that there could be almost 7 million species still waiting to be found. Globally, about 18,000 are discovered every year. And recently, some scientists suspect that one creature found in our forests could be a new species of a worm that's older than the dinosaurs. Yeah, so this worm is at least 500 million years old. Wow. Uh, but you can find them in, in the forest in Singapore. Prof Ali and his team are interested in its excrement. Wow, that's a lot of slime. If you missed that, here it is again. Yeah, so you can see how my finger is just sticking to that like that. Yeah, that's exactly the, that. the, the function of it. The slime hardens quickly, but what's unique is that it can dissolve in water over time. Prof Ali and his team are trying to identify the chemical properties that make this possible. And once they unlock this mystery, they can synthetically create a similar material that could hopefully replace plastic. You could dump it in the ocean and it would degrade into amino acids that any living creature could recycle. So then as a scientist, would you say that you constantly look to nature as kind of this treasure trove of solutions? Uh, yes. In our nature, there's many, many solutions that have been solved over millions of years of evolution for a specific problem. That's the case for many other organisms on the planet, including here. There's many things you can learn from many, many different living creatures. The team is also studying a shrimp that can punch hundreds of times above its weight. Oh! Here we go. Started attacking me. Whoa. Well, actually, you took it. You just knocked it right out of my tweezers. Some mantis shrimp species have two hammer-like clubs. See those? They allow the mantis shrimp to strike their prey with the force of a bullet without any damage to itself. And so we're looking at the material that it's made of. Any material that has to be impact resistant, like bulletproof vessel, mm -hmm. for instance, or uh, maybe new kind of light, lightweight uh, helmet. No, this kind of, uh, of, of a structure could be potentially be used. Every organism has some secret to tell us. The biodiversity, the, the more you, you discover, the more you look at it, the more chance you have to discover something which is completely unexpected. For centuries, we've looked to nature for answers. Leonardo da Vinci conceived the idea of human flight by studying birds. The bullet train's design was inspired by the kingfisher's beak. And more than a hundred medical drugs are derived from compounds found in plants. But recent science has also uncovered that nature doesn't just heal our bodies. You maybe begin to close your eyes. But also, our souls. I just felt like, you know, this very profound sense of rediscovery. I've discovered that nature holds the secrets to modern-day problems. Whoa! Well, actually, you took it. This slime is basically a natural bioplastic. But recent science has also uncovered that nature can have healing powers on our mind and body. I want to put that to the test. So I've signed up for a forest bathing session, one of the latest wellness trends in Singapore. in a million years would I have thought of walking through a housing estate under some MRT tracks and then finding myself in this green oasis. Yumin is my guide. She's just one of seven certified forest therapy guides in Singapore. Hello. Hi. Hello. Nice to see you again. Okay, so uh, Shushan, this is a mat for you. Thank you. Is everyone comfortable? Yeah. Kind of, yes, yeah. Let me take off our shoes. You can if you want to. 
So this invitation is called Pleasures of Presence. Finding pleasure as you become present. Then when you're ready, when you're settled, you feel that you have found a comfortable place to look at. And then you maybe begin to close your eyes. This practice of forest bathing, or Shinrin-yoku, began in Japan in the 1980s. Since then, scientific studies found that trees do have healing powers. They release phytoncytes, a compound that protects them from disease and bacteria. And inhaling them can boost our immunity and reduce stress. So taking your time, slowly rising with your eyes closed. Just allow your vision to come in a soft focus. Take your time. And then notice this whole space that you are in by your sense of sight. What are you noticing? When we were doing that rotational thing, I just felt like, you know, this very profound sense of rediscovery. I just really thought of you know, that moment when you're a fetus and you're coming out of your, of your mom's womb and, and really opening your eyes for the first time, and I just can't imagine how that must feel. I felt for the fetus that I was several decades ago, wishing that, hoping that my birth was as peaceful as what I just experienced. I can't believe it. I just waxed lyrical about my birth. These phytoncytes are clearly doing something to my head. Next up, a slow wander through the forest. I get what this is now. It is a moving, experiential meditation session. Followed by 10 minutes of water gazing. Literally. I feel like I'm in Japan right now. And finally, a tea ceremony to end the session. So, so far, the people I've been speaking to have been trying to educate me about nature in very scientific ways. Now, having experienced nature in a very physical manner has made it a whole lot more personal. <laughs> so naturally, I've jumped at the next chance to get back into the wilderness. But this time, to see the rescued pangolin I saw just days ago. After being treated at the zoo, it's being picked up by Ann Parks for its release back into the wild. Okay, so I can't reveal my location, but what I can tell you is that we're somewhere deep in the jungle. So when deciding on a site to release it, what are the factors you consider? We have to consider uh, whether there's sufficient food, whether there's uh, some shelter, and most importantly, away from the roads. We also see how many that we release are males here. Mm -hmm. I said, how many females? We cannot uh, have a bachelor group here, right? right? So we all have to be taking a lot into consideration. Uh, it's very quiet, so uh, most likely uh, we need some coaxing. So, but let's try. Pangolins typically produce only one or two offspring every year. And they're notoriously hard to breed in captivity. So it's crucial to create the best chances for this bachelor to sow his seeds in the wild. Oops. That's... Into a ball. Oh. So it's just curled up into a ball right now. Um, it is very frightened and very scared. So the NPARCS officers are just trying to coax it into, into being less afraid, I suppose. What, what do you yeah. hope for it? That it will yeah. find a partner and repopulate? And... Yeah. Yes, yes, he's speaking up. Is peeping out? That's some heavy expectations, but the survival of his species depends on it. Well, I hope he gets it on soon. But if anything, recent history has shown us that locally extinct wildlife can return. It's a tale embodied by one particular species. That's one of Bernard's favourite subjects. Look! Ah! <laughs> there they are. There they are. Hello. Hey, there's so many of them. We have two species of otters in Singapore. The smooth-coated otter and its more elusive cousin, 
the Asian small clawed otter that's found only on Pulau Ubin. Watching them, I find it hard to believe that they were once extinct locally. They disappeared in the 1960s when our rivers became so heavily polluted that no marine life could survive. They probably went down the coast and went to Malaysia. And why did they return? What did we do differently? What happened was when we cleaned up our waterways, they were spotted again in the late 90s. So the otters are a success story, right? Does this mean that we could actually attract more species back to Singapore if we do more? So our smooth-coated otters are a very urban and adaptive species. But not all animals that we find in Singapore are this adaptive. Singapore mainland doesn't have ideal habitats, for example, for the Asian small flock to thrive. They, they need shallower waters, they need a mangrove habitats, they need estuarine um, habitats. So it's important that we preserve some existing uh, forests, mangrove areas. In the next episode... When a forest is fragmented, they start to unravel, they start to lose diversity, they start to become very disturbed. The race to save our wildlife from extinction has already begun. We are talking about species which are under threat because we know so little about them. I find out what it takes. Oh my goodness, it's so soft. Never in my life would I have imagined getting so excited about picking up someone else's shit. And whether it's too late to turn back the clock. One thing particularly worrying is that we're getting rare threatened species as roadkill. 